first AKC conversation. I'm here with Professor John Marsden. John is Professor of Addiction Psychology here at King's. Um, I'm Claire Collow, the AKC Director, and I'm also Reader in Philosophy and Theology here at King's. Um, John gave a fantastic AKC lecture for our current series, uh, which is called The Life of the Mind, What is Mental Health? Um, and John talked about uh, cocaine addiction, taking that as an example for, um, for addiction more generally and looking at how the mind um, comes to have addictions and how, how that can be treated. Um, so yeah, it was a really fascinating and inspiring lecture, John. Um, I really enjoyed watching it. Um, and it was interesting the way you, towards the end of the lecture, you talked about the kind of therapy that you've been developing with your team. Mm. Um, I should add, of course, that you, um, for those of you who, those people who haven't um, seen John's lecture, this as well as um, being a research professor, John also runs a clinic, um, a drug treatment clinic in, in Lambeth in South London. Um, so very much a sort of practical um, research life um, <laughs> and, and in, in the work you do. Um, so yeah, so towards the end of the lecture, you talked about this memory focused cognitive therapy that you've been developing. Yes. Um, yes. which was yeah really really interesting um, so I might ask you about that in a, in, a, in a moment but I wanted just to begin by asking you um, you know how did you first come to specialize in addiction psychology what was your why were you drawn to that area in particular oh Claire what a what a fantastic question and I and I, I will try and be as succinct as, as possible <laughs> and it's, thank you very much for the kind invitation to take part um, well, I, my undergraduate degree was in psychology, um, not a million miles away, north from where I'm speaking to you in South London, in Bloomsbury at UCL. And um, on Tottenham Court Road, just adjacent to Good Street Tube Station, what is now some sort of um, sofa warehouse or some sort of furniture store, and I'm really talking about a long time ago, but back then was a, what we, I suppose, have sometimes called in my sort of uh, generation, an amusement arcade. It's a real oxymoron in a way, but this amusement arcade completely fascinated me and it was full of um, slot machines, um, some um, just games, I guess, but they, mainly what caught my eye as I used to walk past was rows and rows of, guys mainly, as far as I could tell, sitting on sort of rickety stools, putting money into these slot machines, these ele electronic gaming machines, as they are now called, sometimes in the day, one-armed bandits. <laughs> they used to have this lever with a black sort of sphere at the end, which you'd grip, a bit like a kind of a gear shift in a Yeah, car. I remember you'd those. pull that, <laughs> the reels would spin, and outward pour your winnings or not. So to cut a long anecdote short, I, I just became very interested in, in gambling. And gambling, of course, now is a behavioral addiction. Mm. And it's an absolutely fascinating territory because it, it, isn't, it isn't drug addiction, is it? But when you begin to think about it, and when you work and talk to people that have gambling problems, it becomes very clear that there are many, many similarities. Mm -hmm. So I did a really simple interview um, study um, with a sample of people and I asked them about whether they thought they had an addiction and what the symptoms were. So that, that got me going, I think, from then on. Yes, yeah. I mean, gambling is a really interesting example because with many addictions, you can focus on on the substance and on the obviously the more physiological sides of addiction. Whereas with gambling, it's 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 more. Um, I guess the focus just has to be on 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 the mind more than than the body. Perhaps. Absolutely, absolutely. So if you, if we think about it, you know, we 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 the most. If someone said, if I ask someone in the street, well, what do you think an addiction is? They probably say, oh, it's it's something to do with, um, say, someone who can't stop smoking or drinking heavily or, or an illegal drug. Yes, yeah. We're comfortable in a way, we're familiar with that. We have representations of that all the time through popular culture, movies, novels, etc. We're aware of it. Lurid stories in the press, sensible reporting of 
the plight of people affected in the broadsheet. Um, and gambling is interesting and it's relevant for the conversation we're having, I think, because as you say, whatever it is, it's not an external drug. Mm. And therefore what it must be is something to do with how we think about our behaviors, um, our relationships, in fact, as it's, as it's turned out over the years, our relationship to the laws of probability mm. which become dissolved as a gambling problem expands, unfortunately. So we, a gambler tends to have some very exaggerated beliefs about probability, mm. um, mastery, um, and some quite often quite magical thinking. Mm. And a lot of those are actually in drug addiction but with the added um, aspect of some of the drugs that I work with, they really assault the way our bodies and our, our brains and therefore our minds yes. work. And they make, they make us suffer some fundamental changes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the changes that have very much inspired me are really neurocognitive. Mm -hmm. um, so how we how we plan, um, inhibit our actions, control our behavior, and also not, not least, um, how we remember things and how we are triggered by our actions to have all sorts of quite complicated mental elaborations, as I, I would be delighted to tell, tell you a bit more about in a minute. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's really interesting. Um, so watching your lecture, so, so I, um, some of the philosophical work I've done has been about habits. Um, and I've been really interested in habit for years. Um, so that's something, yeah, I've, I've done a lot, of, a lot of thinking about that from a philosophical point of view. But when I was watching your lecture, I was struck anew, really, by the power of habits, um, by these mental associations that get built up um, associations with thoughts and experiences and triggers and you know the, the the cash machine that you showed us you know to most people that's a neutral object but for um, but for the, some of the patients you're treating that becomes a trigger for craving drugs you know and the way that the the mind is, can be habituated in Absolutely. these very powerful patterns um, so I want I wonder if you see habit as like an enemy that you have to battle against in treating drug addiction do you think that's sort of something that, um, do you think habit is like an obstacle to, to mental health for, for, for the people you're treating? I guess I certainly think that um, if we're thinking of addiction as, as a habit that's kind of turning round and tightening mm. and becoming more and more ingrained, if, if I'm not mixing my metaphors, <laughs> uh, so that it, it becomes very tightly wrapped Mm. and um, solid mm. and fixed, mm. um, then that, I think, does help us think of addiction in its etiology mm. as a vicious circle yes. um, that has the sort of habitual process that you've written about, the, the way a philosopher would approach this. Um, and I might add, actually, interesting enough, another, another, another connection when I was at UCL was that I was, although I did psychology, I was, and I was never very good at it, I was absolutely inspired by the lectures I had in, from the philosophy department. Oh, right. um, particularly some of the, the philosophy of intention mm. and consciousness. Yes. And I carried that thread, I think, with me because in that vicious process, um, there's certainly some reflective sort of conscious aspects to things, but increasingly I think there's, there's very fast or automatic um, processes that are going on where a lot of the kind of engine room of addiction seems to be just almost unconscious. Mm. Uh, Mm. Or rather, some, perhaps some of the kind of really important things that are happening take place so quickly mm. that by the time there's a sort of conscious, I think of craving as a conscious, elaborative thought. Yes. Um, yes. 
and, and only one that produces, is produced from um, a very implicit autonomous process before it. And so I think it, 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 it helps me and helps my patients, I think, both understand and sometimes make peace mm -hmm. with, the, with the puzzle of addiction, which is that why would I, why would I do this over and over again when it's hurting me, my health, my family, I'm poorer, I'm iller, yes. why do I keep on doing it? So I think that's the fundamental puzzle. And the only thing I'd add that I think is a nice balance to that account is that there is a kind of virtuous cycle which unravels this. Yes. It's sort of quite complicated perhaps, but as we want to kind of loosen these associations, Sometimes I think you can get into quite a virtuous habit mm. that stands in opposition. Yeah. Where we might, um, we might for a while need to be fairly rule-based mm. mm -hmm. um, in order to, I don't know, sort of guide the way. I suppose, I suppose what I mean by that is, is, is having, if someone's trying to cut down on their alcohol consumption, then, it, uh, that they don't want to quit, then it, it serves, it, I've, I have found clinically, it serves the person well if they can have some fairly strong rules mm -hmm. about when and when they don't drink. Mm -hmm. So for example, not ju drinking during the week. Yes, yeah. But enjoying it at the weekend. And, and so those kind of habitual aspects, I think, work well. And maybe they can be loosened mm -hmm. later on when you know, the person can be a bit more freewheeling. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I mean, some of the philosophers I've read who've written about habit have talked about the fact that habits, a habit can't just be broken by either a rational decision or just a sheer force of will, but you need to have like another habit because it has, habit has this sort of power behind it, a kind of momentum behind it that comes through repetition. So you need, you need to kind of find another form of, another sort of, yeah, set of rules and repetition and um, yeah, kind of oppose one habit with something else. And uh, absolutely, and and the the, the the addiction is a wily adversary, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so it doesn't go quietly. Yes. Um, yeah. In fact, we we have a, a a rather mangled phrase of saying it's a chronic relapsing disorder. Yes. And yeah. um, that's mm -hmm. you know we've known that from literature and from the millions of accounts from patients. Unfortunately, so it doesn't go easily. Yeah. And, um, there's, you know, for example, some people almost self-sabotage mm. things that are going well. And mm. it, it is, it, it is, it needs, it sort of needs its own matched, um, it's almost like it needs someone to go into battle with you and for you against it. Yes, yeah. Uh, there are, I mean, I, in an obvious way, and in a microscopic way, if out of the blue, a person, they're strolling down the street, and if out of the blue, they have a strong mental image, um, very sensory, for example, they can, they, they, and it's often caused by something they see in the street, for it, but not always. But if they have that experience, that, takes their attention away from the world and often draws it to the body, as I think I was trying to say in my talk. Um, there's got, and that can be, that can have huge kind of motivational pressure, um, commanding pressure to, to yield. And, and of course, in an era of mobile phones, a, a lot of our patients, you know, can just reach for their, um, yes, it's, drugs. Yes. So it's, it, 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 although it might seem difficult to obtain drugs at first glance, it's actually incredibly easy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's got to be an answer to that thought. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think that's where some of the um, sort of small print of therapy comes in with just trying to help someone um, have an answer to the thought where the thought is, I need and want. Sometimes the answer is, it feels like that, but what do you know will happen if yeah. you buy? 
and the, the yeah. answer is invariably it, it isn't so much of a good time as you yeah <laughs> your brain is telling you it might be yeah I mean, one of the things that i think is so interesting and really inspiring about the therapy that you're developing the memory-based therapy is that it's like you're harnessing the power of the mind um yeah. so it's the it's it's you know the, the the human mind is just such a kind of amazingly complex but also sort of powerful thing and that's you know it's, it's it's almost like it's the power of the mind that sort of got it into that mess in the first place the, the mind's ability to learn to sort of take on new patterns Absolutely. change you know sort of figure out how to get drugs and to sort of you know and, and all the kind of associations and all, all the things that make human minds the way they are that kind of somehow in the case of addiction just gets really focused on this one object you know getting having that sort of drug experience but then what you're doing in your therapy is it doesn't feel so so much like a kind of purely external intervention it's not like you're just giving them a medication to take you're actually using the power of their own minds um, to find a way out of that mess oh, I mean, <laughs> a absolutely and i mean one of the things that we're trying to do at the moment is and I, and you very kindly you know summarized mentioned that i was talking about cocaine and i, I did so because it's a it's a great and sobering example where mm -hmm. um it's almost a perfect model of addiction in that there's this organic stimulant um it has a very powerful ad addiction liability and um drives a, 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 a very psychologically mediated addiction and we don't have a medication for it um yeah. we've got three that we're hoping to trial that we're hoping we can persuade um, one of the funding bodies in the UK to help us stage a trial of, um, so that my, my whole, I mean, I, I guess what I try and do is, I think people in addiction science are really multidisciplinary and we're very, you know, we're really interested in what's happening in the world of neuroscience, um, as we are in the world of ethnography, for example, mm. uh, with just yeah. different targets. And I think, you know, if you if you if we think about depression, um, we know that cognitive therapy um, works just as well as a, a brief targeted prescription of an antidepressant, and that's in no way to be critical of antidepressants. It, used in a targeted and brief way, they can be helpful, but. If someone takes 20 milligrams of citalopram via their GP for a major depressive disorder and they take their prescription um, and their mood lifts, well, that's sort of fantastic. It's almost as if somehow their brain chemistry's changed and maybe they've, maybe as that's lifted, they've, they've become less preoccupied by whatever the Aaron Beck tells us that the main theme in depression is loss. Mm. So whatever they've lost, mm. that maybe they make peace with. Um, what we, I think, try and do in addiction is say, okay, if we've got a medication that we can, we can fire at this problem, great. But it probably isn't going to be as effective as if we additionally add a psychological component. And sometimes really nice outcomes in depression are, occur where you've got cognitive therapy with uh, a medication. So with, with cocaine, all we've got at the moment is our best efforts at helping the sort of mental side. And um, maybe one day we will have some medication as well. We'll have these combination therapies. Mm -hmm. but, but absolutely, we, we, we're really trying to help people. I guess three things, really. Um, or achieve three things. One, get some insight into why this has happened, um, because it's often a puzzle. Mm -hmm. No one ever sets out to have the problems that they present with, I and mean, that would be absurd. Yes. Um, yeah. So it creeps up on you. Um, the second thing is people are very puzzled, as I mentioned, about why this has been maintained, because it mm -hmm. doesn't in, a, in the sense of any logical description of, of our actions um, and our intentions and expectations and outcomes, 
this doesn't pay off. Mm. You know, the, the gambler loses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the only time a gambler wins is if he or she wins and leaves the casino immediately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I remember being in Las Vegas once uh, for a conference and I was flicking idly through the thousand channels in the hotel room and I and I picked up the I think I'm going to make this up but I think it was called the Gambler which was the weekly magazine <laughs> and it said um groundbreaking new theory of gambling revealed I thought oh, I must read the University of Nevada let's say and I thought oh, I must read this <laughs> and it said scientists have discovered that the only way to successfully avoid losing uh, in the instance of winning is to leave the casino at that moment <laughs> because i thought you know on the one hand it's kind of it's almost laughably yeah. absurd yeah. but the point is one when someone wins they put they put all the money back yes uh, yeah because they believe they've suddenly they're on a winning streak yes yeah etc so um no so we try we try and change the odds a little bit with our patients for cocaine so they've got um some kind and motivating beliefs about how this has happened mm. that they have got some insight in what's driving it you know that kind of tightly wrapped vicious circle they they they're able to kind of get some access to and and literally um as a cbt psychotherapist we have a habit of wanting to draw it out as we say yeah we draw out that process with the patient mm -hmm. and then thirdly some some toolkit skills uh, that's the obvious thing um and you know the interesting thing about psychotherapy for, for uh, addictions in the space that i was talking about um is that this is certainly a memory and learning based disorder. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's how hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of consumption episodes are laid down in memory. Yes. yes. Consolidated. Mm -hmm. And we were very taken by the work of trauma focused psychotherapists who work with people with PTSD. Mm -hmm. And what we basically did was adapt the PTSD protocol to addiction. And the PTSD protocol is, say someone has suffered a, um, a traumatic event, um, or they've witnessed one, life-threatening, something really, really horrible. And fortunately, most of us uh, who might suffer something like that recover. Um, but some of us continue to be plagued by intrusive thoughts, mm -hmm. flashbacks, mm -hmm. strong, fearful um, imagery in which we feel as if we're reliving the event. And yeah. it's paralyzing. And actually, it correlates with actually heavy drinking and sometimes other drug use. So it's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. a double whammy. Mm -hmm. So the thing about PTSD treatment is it, it doesn't really get better. Um, by just talking about it uh, and it, we think it gets better because the patient is helped to retrieve this consolidated fear memory mm -hmm. um, they relive it and then whilst it's sort of labile it, it's it, in the crude analogy of of memory as a filing cabinet mm -hmm bookcase of mm -hmm. files you know why not it serves it served me well <laughs> the, re the retrieval of the memory mm -hmm. from the file as a live thing mm -hmm. makes it capable of being adapted mm -hmm. so you could put new information in there or you could loosen yeah. an association so we do exactly the same but with a craving memory yeah and um, that's the, that's really the whole point of the memory focused psychotherapy really to help people access very consolidated drug use memories mm. and loosen them mm. and then stick them back in the filing cabinet yes yeah so when they are retrieved again they're modified yes yeah no it's, it's amazing i mean just the 
the idea that you can actually change someone's mind <laughs> for the better. I mean, I know, I know that obviously, you know, it's not going to work every time and, and, and that this, um, I mean, you talked a bit about that in, in, in the lecture, just the sort of difficulty of, um, yeah, success rates are, you know, kind of modest, but, but, but still I think that, um, I mean, even, even the aspiration to do it is, is itself amazing, but, but any, you know, any, any progress and any, any work you're able to do towards that is, is just, you know, fantastic. It, 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 in, in the channeling a bit of Donald Davison and intention, it's, it's not like flicking, flipping a light switch. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can't turn this off um, in the, in the description of the moment there are no circuit breakers or mm, yes. other, you know, <laughs> what we what we can do is we can i think we can we can build up the, the momentum of this virtuous circle yes yeah, yeah. Mm. um mm. And, but you're right it, we 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 often um ex, we often say to people look we've we've done really well here you've done really well here how about we how about we stop seeing each other weekly and you come in monthly mm. and we taper away like that. And that just gives an opportunity for little top ups and things. And, but sometimes one of the problems with cocaine in particular is that it, it really assaults the, the whole, ex, the sort of frontal striatal part of the brain that, is where is the seat of learning and memory and response yes. inhibition yes. and unfortunately it it fires directly at that yeah. and um yeah. there are some people that are so seriously affected they can't really accept what we're offering mm -hmm. and and that's mm -hmm. that's where it would be so wonderful if we had a medication so we yes. could almost say yes. we're not going to ask you yeah to do too much you know it's a bit like the citalopram example for depression mm -hmm. don't face these awful awful emotions just take the drug mm -hmm. um be kind to yourself as far as you can be mm -hmm. if, if you notice yourself ruminating try and break free and mm -hmm. go for a walk or whatever but let the medication mm -hmm. um, provide some some input and so it, it, hopefully before i hang up my you know kind of therapy <laughs> shoes at the end of my career will have better tools and because it is it is a really hard to treat disorder yes. Um, yes. but yeah even even just i think i i feel sometime I, we had a patient in a trial recently and he said he said i really at times i didn't like it i didn't like you much mm. but at the end of it he said, you were in my face a lot. I said, oh, what, what did you mean by that? He said, well, you were, always, you were always right in there, kind of asking why and what did I make of something, <laughs> etc." And at the time, I used to find it a bit annoying. But he said, you know what, at the end, it was so brilliant. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. And so that, I thought that was fantastic. Yes. It was really inspiring. Yeah. And I saw, yeah. so yeah. if we were to do it again, I, I, sh I shouldn't change. He said, no, no, definitely don't stop. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so great. That's so nice. <laughs> So you, you were talking just a little while ago about the causes of, of um, drug addiction. And I'm sure, obviously, with each individual, there's going to be a whole complex story there about, you know, why each particular person would, would en end up in that situation. Um, but w watching the lecture, obviously, this, the, the series that the AKC series is on is on health. Um, and this lecture was very much focused on sort of a, a disorder, um, but it made it made me think about the fact that you know you could see drug use as in a way a kind of expression of the fact that human beings do really have a desire for mental health. Um, so that so you know that, and that drugs can be taken, perhaps particularly in, at the beginning, they can be they can be a means to yeah. the, you know joy, peace contentment, yes. well-being, relief from some kind of psychological pain. And yes. so in a way, it's sort of testament to the human sort of longing to be healthy um, that, you know, people might resort to that. And then, of course, you know, the horrible irony of that is that then the drug use ends up making mental health 
worse, not better. It doesn't, it proves not to be an effective route to those things, but um, it does, it did seem to me to kind of be almost a sort of, yeah, that, that, that there's a desire, there's a desire for, for something good and important there, but it's just sort of, you know, yeah. misplaced really. You, you've in a way paraphrased beautifully some of the, some of the kind of discussions and points that I try and get over in that first sort of objective of trying to help someone get a purchase on how this has happened. Because yeah. um, yeah. you're absolutely right. Uh, to be really crude, there are, there are, this, is, this lacks granularity, but there are two <laughs> pathways. Mm. Um, there's an adversity pathway. Um, I, we think up to 50% of our patients have um, trauma um, yeah. exposures. So they're using the drug to get away from something else. Yeah, so, so we, you've got, that's an instrumental use mm. to block an yeah. emotion, yeah. Um, ameliorate despair or, mm. or shame or anger, whatever it is. And drugs are pretty good at, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I might rewind what I said about flipping a switch. You can certainly change your mood almost yes. instantly yes. with yeah. a drug. Yeah. yeah. Um, the habit you can't. Yeah. Um, at least not without, you know, major <laughs> changes to the brain. Uh, but so, so there's definitely a, a completely rational instrumental use. Mm. And as you say, this, the really annoying thing is that unfortunately that, coping behavior just has a shelf life to it and eventually it makes it worse and that's that's the real irony of all yeah. of the, the kind of drug story that, that um yeah. it actually makes your um emotions suffer mm. more than they ever would yeah and then the, the other path i suppose are people that they they had a more of a hedonistic you yeah. know they were they yeah they were in, in they were receptive to expression and uh you know our brains are wired to enjoy change you know mm -hmm. how many times have we seen a a child you know in a grassy field spin round and round till they get dizzy and fall over and laugh yeah, <laughs> it, it, yeah. Yeah. we're kind of wired for experience in yeah. a way yeah. um yeah. and that's why in a way there's a whole virtual universe virtuous universe for that isn't there yes, with, yes with, course, yeah. you know art and yeah um just you know the way we express ourselves creatively yeah. um and there is a sort of there is there is a sense of drugs being part of our culture mm. you know, in terms of music yes um, completely yeah you know so that, most, of, most of my favorite music is by people who talk to far too many drugs. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if you, imagine, imagine how a revolver sounded to the Beatles <laughs> with 25 micrograms of LSD on board. I mean, it's yeah. just, you know, it's astonishing. Yeah. It still sounds, and it's, the fact that it still sounds completely fantastic mm. without needing to take that very dangerous drug um, yeah. is amazing. But, you know, I, so the, 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 we, for both of those really crude pathways, um, I'm going to hesitate here a little bit, but I would say that there's probably sometimes up to about 10 years before we, we see people. So mm -hmm. it does incubate for quite a while, yeah. sometimes shorter. Yeah. Um, some of the drugs that we work with have a, a much shorter mm. kind of lead time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, if you look at, you're, you're talking to someone about their history, they might say, well, yeah, well, I, I used to hang out with a bunch of people and we did it for a while, you know, we used to take drugs at the weekend and then, you know, I was, I was at college, I was working, we didn't. And then there was one summer where we seemed to take, we seemed to take a lot of drugs kind of every day for two or three weeks. And then we cooled off again. And then I lost touch with some friends and I made a, another group of friends, you know, and you've got this sort of picture where suddenly, the, the, the sort of focus of the person's life is beginning to really orient mm. towards mm. drug use. Mm. Or, I, I think, and rather awfully, a person can be suddenly exposed 
So mm -hmm. a woman who is injected with heroin by her boyfriend, mm. you know, that's an, mm. I mean, in a way that's a traumatic, mm. one way of looking at that is that it's a traumatic sort of index event if it means that she then becomes yeah. very quickly as addicted as he is. So yeah, loads of pathways. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I read a really amazing novel. I don't know if you know of it. It's by a Danish writer called Tova Ditlefsen. Um, she, anyway, it's not, it's not such, no, it's not a novel. It's, she, she's a writer, a poet, and it's, it's a memoir of how she sort of became a, her childhood. And then, yeah. um, and anyway, she, she ended up in a relationship with a, he was a doctor and he injected her with some kind of a very controlling person and he injected her with some kind of op opioid painkiller and it, she just then became completely dependent on this drug for just years of her life and it nearly killed it was, it's a harrowing it's a really harrowing story but yeah and, and the book is called dependency and it's about her emotional dependency on the relationship and then yeah. it's also like the man's dependency on her it's because he doesn't want to lose her that he ends up like you know, anyway, it's a very messed up um, relationship. Oh, I mean, you, you, you're raising a really important point about sometimes the, the, I'm going to say practicalities, it's not the right phrase, but sometimes the, the only way that someone can escape is to completely rewire all of the relationships that they have, they have and have had because they, they've been fairly toxic in that yes. sense and there's yeah, sometimes yeah. there's kind of codependencies and yes yeah complex i mean that example there is really horrific but yeah um, it's awful yeah, yeah. so i i it, there is a sense sometimes with addiction that people might have to make fairly large mm. scale changes um in order to make you know their, their commitment to, to quitting successful and that's it, it's that to, maybe more or less hard. So, and it's very difficult for someone to make those big changes when they're in a very fragile state because because of their addiction. You know that they sort of don't have the. I mean, it's difficult enough. It can be difficult enough to say leave a relationship, even if you're mentally fairly robust. And then if you're not not at all, if you're very fragile, then yeah. Just w one last question be before we finish. Um, so I was just wondering how. I mean, as we've just been saying, you know, some of this is quite intense and quite heavy and quite difficult yeah. stuff. And I wonder, you know, how you protect your own mental health in your work. Is that something that you have to sort of be quite conscious about doing? And yeah, I just would be interested to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, the one thing that um, is worth saying specifically, there's a general point to make. I was talking to someone, interestingly, this was someone that had had a very intensive um, therapy with me uh, two years ago. And it had worked perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, and then he'd suffered some adversity and it, actually it was as if he'd flicked a switch. <laughs> he went back very quickly to where he was, but um, got in touch again. And, and he, he used to say to me that when he'd finished a therapy session, he was completely exhausted. And I remember saying to him, uh, uh, that particular, the memory focus work that we do is actually really taxing for mm. the therapist as well. Mm. Um, I think because there's a great deal of um, sort of mutual focus. Yeah. Um, I often have my eyes closed and I'm trying to, uh, the patient has, and I'm trying to visualize uh, a very strong sensory image that they're working with mm. and I think that is tiring mm. um, and you know a lot oftentimes the the, the the specific content is actually well it's, sometimes it can be even harrowing yes. it's certainly it's never neutral it's yes. you know there's lots of so yeah no you can you can go home and feel pretty pretty worn out by it um, mm. And I guess we all in, in the field, we, you know, we work in teams where we look after each other. We have supervision. Mm. Um, we're always talking about things. We're always on the watch out for burnout and things. And, and I think the most important thing is to never feel guilty that when you get home, you just close the door. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, you know, you, you can't, 
it, it doesn't help anyone if you sit and ruminate yourself about what you've been doing. Um, and, and, you know, it's sometimes I, I, I've definitely felt myself that I haven't done a great job and that um, if only the, I could sort of hook the person back again <laughs> oh, yeah. how they've gone and, and yeah. you know, I, you, you, you do your best really and it, uh, that isn't always good enough. But I guess it's as long as long as you feel like you've given it as much as you can um, in a structured way, yes. then you know that's yeah. that that has to be enough um, yes. Yes. because there, there's you know in that, in that moment nothing more. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, it, so, it sounds like you have very high standards for you, for yourself. But, yes. Um, yeah. Yes. We, we, you know, we we would say that every single patient we work with can um, recover. Mm, mm. and it may just be that we need to stay with that person for quite a while um, so that we're not making any exaggerated claims for the goals that they can set um, but there might be some quick wins along the way but yeah I think sometimes it's it, it certainly takes takes a good sometimes several years mm, mm. yeah Yes. And that, the great thing about the NHS, of course, uh, just a little um, <laughs> plug, is that people can stay for as long as they want. Mm. Mm. And that's just awesome. You yeah. know, that, that yeah. we, we are fortunate to have a healthcare system that uh, is just open armed like that. The only problem is that we don't have so much capacity as we would like, but yeah. we never show someone the door. And I think that's, it's inspirational for everyone, really. Yeah, no, it is wonderful, and it's such a <clears throat> such a sort of it's, as you say, it is a, an inspiring part of what King's does. Um, and obviously, I'm in the, I'm in the humanities faculty, so it's um, it's a very different kind of very different kind of work. And so, but yeah, it is amazing to be part of the institution that's that is yeah part of the NHS. And as you say, just a fantastic institution. Absolutely, look, yeah, but a plug for our own organisation. Yeah, we are we are a great um uni um we work closely with the south london morsley trust and guys and st thomas's and king's college hospital and it's a fantastic um partnership of people working together you know our teaching is world class um and we're one of a reasonably small set of sort of centers of excellence in, in centers of excellence in the addictions world and sometimes it can be bit dispiriting when you think the money is just drying out but we we keep going really and you know we'll, we'll probably if we're lucky have our day and get some some further funding um if we can just continue to make the case i think if we if we can't if we get it if we sort of become downtrodden then no one wins really but um mm -hmm. you know we have to sort of keep keep going really yes <laughs> well well good luck i'm, sh I'm sure i'm i'm sure that you know the the work you're doing and continuing to do is just really valued and appreciated by by so many people um and thank you so much for your time today it's been really interesting and really enjoyable just to have a chance to ask you some questions and talk to you a bit more about your work so Likewise. thank you so much john thank you my great pleasure All the best.